So um, I just thought I'd give first a brief overview of somewhat historical uh, data of what is known about neuroblastoma predisposition, and then also touch on what has been maybe published since our last ANR meeting, and then briefly touch on what is being presented at this meeting that may be novel. So it was originally described by Knudsen and Strong in 1972 that some neuroblastomas are inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. It's thought that family history is present in about one to 2% of cases. And these children tend to have an earlier age of onset and present with multiple primary tumors. It's noted that there is incomplete penetrance. This is seen through clinically occult tumors as well as spontaneous regression. And unfortunately, multi-generational pedigrees are rare, uh, or fortunately, due to the lethality of um, the disease, but it makes it difficult to study. So by studying children with neuroblastoma and associated conditions of neural crest-derived tissues, FOX2B was identified as the first bona fide neuroblastoma predisposition gene in 2014. Germline mutations, however, are relatively rare, and this accounts for about 5% of families with neuroblastoma. And somatic mutations have not been reported. However, FOX2B has been shown to be a master regulator of normal, neuro normal development of the autonomic nervous system and plays a key role in differentiation in neuroblastoma. So through an international effort to collect families in order to perform a well-powered linkage study analysis and try to get at the genetic underpinnings of familial neuroblastoma, um, back in 2008, uh, this linkage study was made possible. And if you recall, there was a peak on chromosome 2P with a high LOD score. This region encompassed MCN as well as at the other end, the ALK gene, which we all now know to be the major familial neuroblastoma predisposition gene. And this accounts for about 80% of families. And importantly, ALK is also one of the most frequently uh, somatically mutated genes in neuroblastoma. So despite the fact that this accounts for 80% of families, there does appear to be incomplete penetrance. And this is seen in this family here where there are obligate carriers who are asymptomatic. Therefore, there's a genome-wide linkage analysis that is still ongoing in uh, Yala Mose's lab in order to identify genetic modifiers of ALK mutation penetrance in familial neuroblastoma. So if we summarize what we do know about the familial neuroblastoma genes and loci identified to date, about 80% harbor germline ALK mutations, another 5% have mutations in FOX2B, and that leaves another roughly 15% that are unaccounted for, suggesting that the presence of a familial neuroblastoma 3 gene may, may exist. But this is only 1-2% of cases, so why does neuroblastoma occur in children without a family history? And the hypothesis that was set about 10 years ago now by uh, John Maris and others was that neuroblastomas arise due to a complex interaction of variations in multiple neurodevelopmental genes or regulatory units. And to test this hypothesis, the experimental design was to form, perform a genome-wide association study of cases, that is, children who have neuroblastoma, and controls, which are children without cancer. And here we're genotyping these children, uh, blood DNA from these children using Illumina SNPRAs in both cases and controls. And on the right, this is just the first published genome-wide association study in neuroblastoma and indeed in any pediatric cancer that um, really set the stage and um, uh, definitively uh, defined the fact that GWAS um, can, I'm sorry, <laughs> define the genetic basis of sporadic neuroblastoma. So since then, there's been about 6,200 children with neuroblastoma that have been genotyped through this project, and over 15,000 controls are children without cancer. The goal is to genotype 7,500 cases and 15,000 controls. And what is shown here is just an example Manhattan plot, where each of these dots represents a single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP. They're plotted along the genome from chromosome 1 all the way down to chromosome 22. We typically do not analyze X and Y. And what's plotted here is negative log 10 of a p-value for association with neuroblastoma based on allele frequencies at each SNP. So these peaks here are what we're most interested in, and these are the signals that tell us that there's an association with disease. 
So if we consider what's already published, we've identified several signals that appear to be enriched in what is what's considered low-risk neuroblastoma, the more benign form of the disease. Then there's another sort of set of um, association signals that tend to be broad susceptibility alleles where they don't seem to predispose to either low or high-risk neuroblastoma, but rather broadly to neuroblastoma. And then there's a set that are enriched in high-risk neuroblastoma, or the more aggressive form of the disease. And again, this is novel and, and tells us that even at the, the germline genetic level, we can identify subsets of neuroblastoma. So in addition to looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms, we can use these data to look at copy number. And this is just showing the detection of a 592 KB deletion on chromosome 16P11.2. And this uh, was identified um, using Illumina SNP arrays. And in a comparison of just over 2,000 neuroblastoma cases and 6,000 controls, we identified this and several others as being associated with neuroblastoma. So if you look over on the right, all these leads are very rare. In cases, we see it at just about half a percent. They're virtually non-existent in controls with an odds ratio of 8.9. So we identified several others, one at 15Q13.3, one at 16P13.1, and one at 22Q11 within the DeGeorge region. So we weren't powered at the time to replicate all of these, but because the 16P11.2 microdeletion is very well known, it has been uh, linked to autism, developmental delay, early onset childhood di uh, obesity, as well as several other neurodevelopmental disorders. There's a lot of published um, data looking at this locus, so we were able to pool over 56,000 control individuals and replicate this association in an independent set of 1,167 cases with a similar odds ratio of 7.8. And of note, this is considerably higher than what we see typically in a genome-wide association study, so we're very excited about that. Um, the plot down here on the left is simply showing where these deletions lie. This is confirmed by whole genome sequencing as shown here. Um, unfortunately, finding a causal gene has been a challenge because this region contains 29 known genes. The region is flanked by segmental duplications, which is likely what's driving the copy number variation. So as we continue to build the numbers, we will try to replicate these other uh, rare microdeletion or duplication syndromes that we are seeing in neuroblastoma. Just to present a little bit of novel data that has been shown at the meeting, um, as we build the numbers, this is based on a comparison of just over 2,000 controls and 4,000 I'm sorry, 2,000 cases and 4,000 controls. And we identified two new signals. One is within the myeloid leukemia factor 1 gene on 3Q25, and the other is within, other is within CPZ on 4P16. Both of these um, associations were replicated robustly in an um, independent set of data from an African-American population from the UK, as well as a, a cohort from Italy. Um, again, with odds ratios approximately 1.2 to 1.3. In addition to this, Mark Applebaum will be presenting later at a parallel session a recent analysis that he and Sukon had done looking at um, MCN amplified cases versus low and intermediate risk neuroblastoma. So here a case is defined as a high risk neuroblastoma patient with MCN amplification and controls or lower intermediate risk neuroblastoma patients. And what you can see here First is the known signal of BARD1 at um, chromosome 2Q35, but then there is this other peak right next to it on chromosome 3P. And this happens to fall within a gene called KIF15. And I'm not going to go into any more detail about this, but I uh, encourage you to go hear Mark's talk later this afternoon. So in addition to trying to identify new variants, we've also been trying to map causal variants and understand the biological relevance of some of the signals that we've been seeing. So this is an example. If we go back to the initial publication identifying 6P22 as a neuroblastoma susceptibility locus, at the time there wasn't much known about this region and there was one hypothetical gene there. Now what we know is that there's at least two long non-coding RNAs that map to this locus. 
Um, and here I'm just highlighting the region where the association signal is. And the, the gene of interest is CAS15, or cancer susceptibility candidate 15. Of note, there's also in the opposite direction, CAS14, which is the cancer susceptibility candidate 14. Um, what I'm going to show today has to do with the 15. So as you can see, there appears to be um, perhaps an enhancer region here. And in addition to this longer isoform of CAS15, we see a shorter isoform that seems to map to this potential enhancer region. If we look at RNA-seq data from neuroblastoma, what we see is it's actually this short variant that is expressed at, at relatively high levels, whereas the long, long isoform of CAS15 and also CAS14 are expressed at very low levels or not at all. So based on these data together, um, Mike Russell had mapped a putative causal variant and done, he did a luciferase assay to demonstrate that the risk alleles at this variant are associated with decreased CAS15 expression, consistent with the role of tumor suppression in neuroblastoma. In addition, he then knocked down CAS15 short isoform in a panel of neuroblastoma cell lines, and what is shown here is that it actually enhances cell growth quite significantly compared to a non-targeting control or empty vector. So to look at patient data, you can see that low expression of CAS15 also predicts poor survival. So based on these data, we think that CAS15 is a neuroblastoma tumor suppressor um, identified by GWAS. And just to give one other example, sorry, recently published, this is going back to the LMO1 locus, which is also enriched in high-risk neuroblastoma. By, gene, by uh, performing genotype imputation, we were able to identify a highly significant SNP that mapped to this region, and this star indicates it's within a transcription factor binding site. And if we look a little more closely, this is the SNP here. This is plotting negative log 10 of the p-value. Again, these are all the variants across the locus. You can see that it's in a highly conserved region, an area of DNAs1 hypersensitivity, and we also see peaks by P300 chip and Biata 3 chip. And indeed, if you map this SNP back to the genome, it actually resides within a canonical GATA binding motif and disrupts a highly conserved um, position in that motif. So again, we performed a luciferase reporter assay, and this is just showing where this enhancer maps between exon 1 and exon 2. And after doing the reporter assay, we see that the risk allele at this locus is associated with um, higher activity. And then if we look at H3K27 acetyl signal in neuroblastoma cell lines either harboring the risk allele or the protective allele, where Kelly here would be considered harboring the risk allele, we see evidence of LMO1 being potentially a super enhancer, whereas in um, those cell lines that have the protective allele, we see very little activity. So here we conclude that we've mapped a causal variant at the LMO1 locus that maps to a super enhancer and drives LMO1 expression. So in addition to GWAS, there have been several studies performing whole genome or whole exome sequencing of germline DNA as well as tumor DNA to try to discover germline mutations driving uh, childhood and other cancers. Um, and I'm not going to go into great detail in all of these, but this is a nice paper that was published from Jim Downing's group at St. Jude and with Jing, Jing Wei Zhang. There's another group here from Will Parsons. And we have um, an abstract that will be presented later today, also in Parallel 13, uh, where we've looked at germline mutations in 776 children with neuroblastoma. And in the end, we think these studies are in general agreement that there are 5 to 10 percent of neuroblastomas that um, harbor germline mutations in known cancer predisposition genes. And I figured I would just give one um, example of something we are seeing. This was previously reported, but I think now we have larger numbers and can be slightly more definitive about it. This is the identification of rare pathogenic or likely pathogenic mutations in BARD1 that are enriched in neuroblastoma. So recall BARD1 is one of the high-risk neuroblastoma susceptibility loci identified by GWAS. Um, those were common variants. These are very rare variants. Um, there's only one that is seen in more than one patient. They're basically spread throughout the gene. Four of them are truncating. Others involve splicing for the most part. Um, 
and these were, uh, some were reported previously, but I think with these higher numbers, we can now say with some level of confidence that these rare uh, pathogenic mutations occur in about 1.2% of neuroblastoma, and these are significantly enriched compared to the general population. So if we think about the genetic basis of neuroblastoma and, and the model for how we can think about this, this is a modified figure from um, Manolio back in 2009, published in Nature, where on the, this axis we're plotting allele frequency, and here we're plotting the effect size. So what we can see is the highly, um, highly penetrant germline mutations, ALK and FOX2B, are very rare but have very large effect sizes. In contrast, if we look over to the right, these are what we're identifying by GWAS. These are relatively common variants with pretty low or modest um, effect sizes. And then there are some in the middle, such as the 16P, C, and V that I mentioned, and these BARD1 rare variants. So in addition, there's this ever-growing group of um, very rare but potentially highly penetrant mutations in various known cancer genes and other genes. Um, and I think a challenge in the future is going to be understanding the, the clinical and biological significance of some of these. So in summary, in terms of familial neuroblastoma, we know that ALK is the major predisposition gene. We know that the penetrance is still not known and that modifiers of ALK mutations remain to be discovered. About 10 to 15 percent of families don't harbor an ALK or FOX2B mutation, suggesting that maybe a third familial neuroblastoma predisposition gene remains to be identified. And if we think about sporadic neuroblastoma, or those kids that don't present with a family history, we think the GWAS has successfully identified nearly a dozen new susceptibility loci or genes, and that there are likely more to be discovered of low or intermediate effect size. And perhaps what I think one of the main benefits of this work has been is the unbiased identification of genes driving the initiation as well as progression of neuroblastoma. And finally, I think sequencing studies will reveal rare variants and mutations with very large effect sizes, but in order to understand the significance of these, we're going to need very, very large sample sizes. And finally, in terms of remaining challenges, I think right now we don't really have an understanding of what the interaction between common variants and rare mutations are in driving neuroblastoma tumorigenesis. And we also have very little knowledge about whether the rare variants and mutations we're identifying in sporadic neuroblastoma arise de novo or um, are inherited. And so I think it's going to be very important to look at uh, parental DNA in the future. And with that, I would just like to acknowledge the many people that contributed to this work. Um, and there, I'm sure there are many others who probably aren't on this slide. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon, for that beautiful overview.